My Window Radio Classics Theater now presents Rappuccini's Daughter by Nathaniel Hawthorne. His name was Giovanni Goscanti. He was the son of an ancient friend. You, away from the building entry. There's no loitering here. What? No, I beg your pardon, signora. I wasn't loitering. You were snoozing. Too much vino last night? Well, you couldn't convince a barmaid to take you in, and you won't convince Dame Lisabetta. I am responsible for these premises, which have not yet sunk so low as to accommodate street bums. Signora, I'm not the street. You know, I was only in reverie just now with that fine coat of arms above your door. <laughs> well, this was once the home of Paduan Noble. Oh, that's no doubt. You know, I recollect an ancestor of that family was worthy of mention by our great poet Dante in his masterwork. Is that so? Perhaps this man, he was once an occupant of this very mansion. Well, I can see you'd be in a barmaid's bed if that was your object. Actually, I wouldn't mind staying a while in this fine edifice, if there were a suitable room. And what would be suitable for you? Well, I confess, Signora, that I do not have a pocket full of gold ducats. I'm a student from the South. The South, eh? There's a room. I suppose you'll tell me this ancestor was described with the poet's lady in heaven. No, Signora. I'm afraid he was a partaker of a mortal agonies in the other place. A cunning boy, Giovanni, but not insincere. He was endeavoring to study at the University of Padua, where I taught medicine. But the room he took in that old mansion held other interests. <laughs> oh, good afternoon, Signor Cascanti. I didn't see you by the window there. I thought I'd fresh in your room while you were at classes. The garden down there is amazing. Does it belong to the house, Dame Elisabetta? Heaven forbid. Unless it were fruitful of better pot herbs than grow there now. No, that garden is cultivated by Giacomo Rappuccini, the famous doctor. I've heard of him, I think. It's said he distills those plants into medicines that are as potent as a charm. I was watching him just now. He doesn't look like an ordinary gardener. No. In his scholar's garb, he's, he's black among all the colors. That one shrub there, do you notice it? With the purple blossoms, every other bush, it seems to, it seems to orient around it. It's magnificent. Mm. I thought when I came in that you were spying at his daughter. Dr. Rappuccini has a daughter. Oh, yes. Good afternoon, Signor. Mm. The doctor's garden, it must have been quite a pleasure place. With that ruin of marble fountain in the center there. A sculpture with a rare art. And that purple bush. It could light the whole garden without sunshine. Wait. There he is again, the signora. He's standing to paradise with thick gloves. Ah, now he comes to the magnificent plant next to the fountain. Why is he taking out a mask to cover his face? <coughs> Beatrice! Beatrice! <coughs> yes, father. Uh, come out here. <coughs> Holy virgin. Here I am, Father. <coughs> what would you? Oh, uh, Beatrice, you see how much needs to be done with our chief treasure here. But I can no longer approach it. <coughs> I fear this plant must be consigned to your sole charge. Ah, and <coughs> gladly. I will undertake it. I will nurse you, my sister. And now shall reward Beatrice with your perfumed breath. Ah, the breath doctor. of life. Wow, she is as beautiful as the old garden. Damned window shutter. <coughs> Beatrice! What, Father? Uh, come, it's time to go in. What? What's the matter? He has her by the arm. Why is he taking her away? Did he see me? Hmm, it appears the doctor is very protective of his flowers. Soon enough, Giovanni came to university to pay his respects to me. Dr. Bayone, I come with a letter of introduction from your ancient friend, my father. And though the young signor's interest soon turned to my famous colleague, Rappuccini. But the boy brought Tuscan wine, and soon enough I was talking, <laughs> saying such as might even have inadvertently encouraged his interest. 
Rappuccini is a man who would sacrifice anything for the sake of adding so much as a grain of mustard seed to the great heap of his accumulated knowledge. It's an awful trait indeed. Yeah. Though I suppose few others are capable of so spiritual a love oh, of science. God forbid, unless they take sounder views of the healing art. His theory is that all medicinal virtues are comprised within those substances which we term vegetable poisons. These he cultivates with his own hands. Mm, that explains the gloves. He is said to have produced poisons worse than nature that without him would never have existed. Has he ever caused any harm? That a senior doctor does less mischief than he otherwise might with such dangerous substances is undeniable. Has he ever done any good? Good! <laughs> More one from the fast, Senor Rayoni. Uh, thank you. Uh, now and then, it, it must be owned, Rappuccini has affected or seemed to affect a marvelous cure of some ailment or other. But to tell you my private mind, Signor Giovanni, he should receive little credit for such successes, but should be held strictly accountable for his failures, which may justly be considered his own work. But surely, Signor Bayoni, there's one object more dear to Dr. Rappuccini than his work. And what would that be? His daughter. Ah, so you've heard of this daughter of Signor Rappuccini. Hmm. Many have. She is an incomparable beauty. You've seen her with your own eyes? Yes. There are far fewer who can claim that. And as I had nothing more to offer on that subject, my meeting with the young senor was ended. I'm sure now that he supposed I was merely jealous of my rival. And who knows? He may even have done some research into certain uh, black letter tracts preserved in the medical department of the University of Padua, detailing the professional warfare between us, in which it was estimated that the famous Dr. Rappuccini had gained the advantage. We will return to Rappuccini's Daughter by Nathaniel Hawthorne, presented by High Window Radio Classics Theater, after these commercial messages. And now, before we return to tonight's performance, let's step back and look in on Sally Gibson and Hilda, her maid, who is helping Sally change for her scene. Quick, Hilda, hold this dress. I've never been so excited in all my life. It's really wonderful, isn't it, Miss Sally? So wonderful. Oh, that scene in the garden. It made me think of Henry, Miss Sally. Miss Sally, if I had your complexion, do you suppose Henry would... What, Hilda? Help me. What's wrong with my face, Miss Sally? Those red blotches just won't go away. Soap, probably. What kind are you using? Some beauty soap, I suppose. Yes, Miss Sally. The one that promises radiant beauty, glamorous youth, irresistible loveliness. Oh, Miss Sally, I had hoped Henry would... <laughs> yes, so did I once. And then I learned the truth. Hilda... You can't feed the pores of your skin with beauty oils and mysterious ingredients. No. And many highly perfumed, prettily colored soaps contain fatty acids and free alkaloids that really irritate and harm your skin. But, Miss Sally... My doctor recommended ivory because all any soap can do is cleanse. And to protect the fine texture and pores, a soap should cleanse gently. And to do that, a soap must be pure. He said ivory would help to keep my skin smooth and fine. And Miss Sally, do you think Henry would? Oh, quick, my gloves, Hilda. It's the bell for the second act. No, Hilda will never get a Grecian nose by using a beauty soap, but we do hope she gets Henry. We now return to Rappuccini's Daughter, presented by High Window Radio Classics Theater. Many things diminish on second look, but from the shadow of his window, Giovanni Guscanti could attest that Signor Rappuccini's daughter was not such a case. Ah, give me thy breath, my sister. 
But I am faint with common and air. And there she is again at the purple shop. And more stunning and simple and sweet than I had formerly imagined her. And give me this flower, which I will separate with the gentlest fingers from the stem and place close beside my heart. I can only imagine what those gentle fingers... Wait, why is that little orange lizard at her feet contorting so violently? It's dead. She crosses herself. What is this being beautiful, shall I call her, or inexpressibly terrible? She moves this way. Signora, there I throw down to you pure and healthful flowers. Wear them for the sake of Giovanni Gusconti. Ah, thank you, Signor. I, I accept your gift. Excellent. They will go well with the captivating purple flower you already wear. Oh, yes. Uh, I would fain recompense you with it for your generosity. But if I toss it into the air, it will not reach you. So, Signor Guasconti must content himself with my thanks. By all means. You, you may gather them up if you wish. Hmm? The flowers. Oh, yes. Giovanni Gosconti could not help but notice how the young woman hesitated to pick up his bouquet. Or maidenly reserve, perhaps. Though that would hardly explain the bouquet seeming to wilt in her hand as she vanished into the house of her father. For days the signor avoided the window that looked into Dr. Rappaccini's garden. Nothing to spoil his feverish dreams. Instead, he burned and shivered with a kind of madness for this spirit, which he fancied to be some wild offspring of both love and horror. He took to the streets of Padua, his footsteps keeping time to the throbbing in his brain, till his walk accelerated to a race. That is when I happened to meet and stop him. Off of my arm, old fool. Just Giovanni Cascanti, stay, my young friend. Have you forgotten me? That might well be the case if I, if I were as much altered as yourself. Yes, I am Giovanni Guscanti, and you are Bayoni. Now, Professor Bayoni, let me pass. Not yet, signor. What, did I grow up side by side with the father that the son should pass like a stranger? No, I would have a word with you. Spilly then, Professor. Cannot the Professor see that I am in haste? Yes, I can. And so can our friend Rappaccini across the street there. Who? Dr. Rappaccini. Ah, he recognizes me, that cold nod in his... <laughs> that was him. Disappeared around the corner there. It's an odd coincidence. Not at all. He's making a study of you. What do you mean? You believe he was following me? I know that look of his. It is the same that coldly illuminates his face as he bends over a bird or a butterfly before he kills it by the perfume of a flower. Signor Giovanni, I will stake my life upon it. You are the subject of one of Rappaccini's experiments. <laughs> will you make a fool of me? That, Professor Bayoni. We're an untoward experiment. Patience, patience. I tell thee, my poor Giovanni, thou hast fallen into fearful hands. And the Signora Beatrice, what part does she act in this mystery? Good afternoon, Professor Bayoni. The youth broke away from me before I could seize his arm again. Well, we will see who better knows the arcana of medical science, most learned Rappaccini. You and your infernal daughter. Perchance, I may foil you where you little dream of it. Signor Giovanni, good afternoon. Did you enjoy your walk? Oh, up to your room so soon? Ah, uh, yes, Elisabetta. You need not to attend to me this evening. Signor, listen, Signor. There is a private entrance to the garden. What do you say? There's a private entrance into Rappaccini's garden. Hush! Not so loud, Signor. Yes, into the worshipful doctor's garden, where you may see all his fine shrubbery. Many a young man in Padua would give gold to be admitted among these fine flowers. Well, here's your piece, then. Now show me. Yes. Come, Signor Giovanni. This door here. Oh, step carefully, Signor. The passage is dark. Yes, it is. And I wonder, what is your p real part in this? What, Signor? Keep going. It makes no difference. I must approach her. 
Wait, this, this impulse is not of the heart. This is a fantasy of the brain. What's the matter, senor? You wish to turn back? Yes. Ah, do you feel that breeze? The sunlight is just around the corner, there. All right, m move out of my way. Here I am, underneath my own window. How often is it the case that when dreams have condensed into reality, we find ourselves calm, even coldly self-possessed? So it was now with young Giovanni in the garden of Dr. Rappaccini. This vegetation, it's, it's such a commixture of species. And these are not of God's making. This is depraved fancy. This is a mockery of beauty. Ah, you are a connoisseur in flowers, senor. It is no marvel, therefore, if the sight of my father's rare collection has tempted you to take a nearer view. I... Hello, senora. If he were here, he could tell you many strange and interesting facts about them. He has spent a lifetime in such studies. This garden, it's, uh, it's his world. I've heard that you are as deeply skilled in the virtues indicated by these blossoms, senora. Are there such idle rumors? What a jest is there, no. Though I have grown among these flowers, I know no more of them than their hues and perfumes. Sometimes methinks I would fain rid myself of that small knowledge. There are many, and those not the least brilliant, that shock and offend me when they meet my eye. But pray, senor, do not believe these stories about my science. Believe nothing of me, save what you see with your own eyes. I might rather you ask that I believe nothing save what comes from your own lips, senora. I do so bid you. Forget whatever you may have fancied in regard to me. If true to the outward senses, still, it may be false in its essence. But the words of Beatrice Rappaccini's lips are true, from the depths of the heart outward. The glow of Rappaccini's daughter was breathtaking, and yet Giovanni was reluctant for other reasons to draw her rich fragrance into his lungs. Then he gazed past her eyes into her soul and felt no more doubt or fear. She talked about matters as simple as the daylight or summer clouds, and now about the city and Giovanni's own distant home. You have sisters. I am brothers too. And do you have many friends? <laughs> yes, I have plenty of friends, though none of special consequence. I have heard tell that Padua could not contain your admirers, Signora. My admirers? That could not be so. It could only be so. Why should you think otherwise? How could they know of me when I do not know of them? Do you not? Not even one or two. <laughs> This garden, senor, that is all. Ah, we come to the fountain. I have admired its ruins from my window and the purple shrub that you'd care for. Its fragrance smells like... Well, it smells like you, senora. Oh, my sister. For the first time in my life, I had forgotten me. I remember, senora, that you once promised to reward me with one of these blossoms for the bouquet that I had the happy boldness to fling at your feet. Permit me now to pluck it, as a memorial of this interview. Giovanni, no, touch it not. Oh, very well. I no longer have the desire to, since you have replaced it with your own hand. It's... it's fatal. Fatal? Wait, why do you run away? She has disappeared beyond the entrance. And look who's there. Dr. Rappaccini. That night in his chamber, the young senor awoke with his hand, burning in pain. Ah! A purple print, like four small fingers, where she touched me. Such a token might be considered further proof of a frightful peculiarity in the senora's physical and moral system. But, by the subtle sophistry of passion, Giovanni's mind soon turned it into a golden crown of enchantment. She's entirely unique, unlike any creature I've ever met. After the first interview, there was a second and a third in the inevitable course of what we call fate. A meeting with Beatrice in the garden 
was no longer an incident in the daily life of Giovanni, but the whole space in which he might be said to live. And if by some chance he failed to come at the appointed moment, the Signora stood beneath his window, her sweet fragrance floating up and around him. Giovanni! Giovanni! Why tearest thou? Come down! But for all the words of love now being spoken in that Eden of poisonous flowers, there yet had been no seal of lips, no clasp of hands. He had never touched a ringlet of her hair. Her, her garment, so marked was the physical barrier between them, had never been waved against him by a breeze. Beatrice, why do you grow so sad? I only wanted to hold, to, to caress, to feel, to close this desolate separation. Ah, good morning, Signor Gisconti. Uh, I happen to be passing on my way to uh, university. <laughs> really? I did not understand the dwelling, this dwelling to be situated between the University of Padua and your own home, <laughs> Professor Bayoni. <laughs> oh, well, uh, my route is not always direct. And uh, how are your studies, Signor? Studies? <laughs> They're completely absorbing, I assure you. Mm. Yes, methinks I overheard one of your recitals just now as I approached your door. Uh, I've been reading a classic author lately, the story of uh, an Indian prince who sent a beautiful woman as a present to Alexander the Great. Uh, do you recall it? She was poisonous. It's a childish fable. Mm, yes, uh, when it was written, perhaps. Uh, and what is this fragrance in your apartment, Signor? Faint, but uh, delicious, and yet, after all, by no means agreeable. Uh, were I to breathe it long, it would make me ill. There is no fragrance, Signor, except in your worship's imagination. No, I doubt that. Were I to fancy an odor, it would be some humble apothecary drug wherewith my fingers are lucky enough to be imbued. Our friend Rappuccini, I've heard, tinctures his medicaments with odors richer than Araby. His daughter likely has similar talent. Signor Professor, you are my father's friend. I would fain feel nothing toward you save respect and difference. But I pray you to observe, Signor, that there is one subject on which we do not speak. You know not the Signora Beatrice. My poor Giovanni, I, I, No, you do not know, and therefore you cannot estimate the wrong, the blasphemy that is offered to her character by a lighter injurious word. I know this wretched girl far better than yourself. Her father was not restrained by family affection from offering her up as a victim of his insane zeal for science. He has made her deadly. What then will be your fate? This is a phantasm. But if so, at least her poison has not yet insinuated itself into my system. I am no flower to perish in her grasp. Yes, be of good cheer. You still breathe. Do you see this little silver vase in my hand? And what of it? It was wrought by the hands of the renowned Benvenuto Cellini. Well worthy to be a love gift to the fairest dame in the city. But its contents are invaluable. One sip would have rendered the most virulent poisons of the Borgias innocuous. Take it to your Beatrice. And you say this will cure her? Possibly we may succeed in bringing her back within the limits of ordinary nature from which her father's madness has estranged her. Thank you, Professor Bayoni. I will deliver it with haste. Yes, do so, son of my ancient friend. We will thwart Rappuccini yet! This garden of Dr. Rappuccini. Even the spiders have to be careful here. Look, it falls at my feet as if, as if I were poisonous. Ah, Giovanni, here you are at the fountain. I was waiting beneath your window. Beatrice, whence came this shrub? Oh, my father, uh, he created it. Created it? What does that mean? He is a man uh, fearfully acquainted with the secrets of nature. 
At the hour when I first threw breath, this plant, it, it sprang from the soil. I was nursed with its breath. Uh, it was my sister. Giovanni, approach it not. And why not? Hast thou not suspected it? There were an awful doom, the effect of my father's fatal love of science, uh, which has estranged me from all society of my kind. Until heaven sent thee, Giovanni. Another one? What? Another insect, it falls at my breath. A cursed one! Thou hast filled my veins with poison. I am made as hateful and as ugly a creature as thyself. Holy Virgin, pity me. Why dost thou join thyself with me thus in those terrible words? And dost thou pretend ignorance? <laughs> Behold, this power I have over nature's creatures. I have gained from the pure daughter of Rappuccini. I see it. I am the horrible thing thou namest me, Giovanni. But this was not I. I dreamed only to love thee for a little while. I to gain an image in my heart before sending thee away. For though my body be nursed with poison, my spirit is, is God's creature. Some, some part of me has apprehended this. I would that thou would kill me. What is death after such words as thine? And, and knew that I, I should be estranged from all else, rather than be separated from thee. But it may not be necessary. Beatrice, behold, this vase. Oh, it's... It's beautiful. A wise physician has assured me it contains ingredients most opposite to those by which thy awful father has brought this calamity upon thee and me. It is distilled of blessed herbs. Let us drink it together and thus be purified of all evil. Give it to me. Uh, I will drink. I see thou art no longer lonely in the world. Father. Rappuccini. <coughs> Go ahead, daughter. Pluck one of thy precious gems from the sister shrub and bid thy bridegroom wear it in his bosom. It will not harm him now. My science and the sympathy between thee and him have so wrought within his system that he now becomes apart from a common man. Oh, my father, wherefore didst thou inflict this miserable doom upon thy child? Miserable? <laughs> what do you mean, foolish girl? Dost thou deem it misery to be endowed with marvelous gifts against which no power could avail an enemy? Would thou have preferred the condition of a weak woman exposed to all evil and capable of none? I would fain have been loved, not feared. Oh, but it matters not. I am going, Father, where the evil which thou hast striven to mingle within my being, it will pass away like a dream. Beatrice, what's the matter? Why does my daughter faint? The, the antidote. It, it was supposed to save her. Uh, farewell, Giovanni. Thy words of hatred are like, like lead within my heart. But they too will fall away as I ascend. Oh, there was there not from the first more poison in thine than in mine. There could be no salvation for such a one so radically altered. As poison had been life to Rappuccini's daughter, so the antidote I provided was death. Of course, I had no idea that doctor meant to engineer with, with respect to Giovanni, an act of solace for his daughter. I, I did not think him capable. On the balcony of Giovanni's room, I saw the son of my ancient friend doomed now to exist in that garden of evil. The doctor saw the child of his flesh slip away beyond all the power of his science. Thus we both witnessed the fatality that attends all efforts of perverted wisdom. Rappuccini! Rappuccini! And this is the upshot of your experiment? Thank you for listening to Rappuccini's Daughter, presented by High Window Radio Classics Theater. It featured Brett Owen, Anthony Sicato, Lisa Tassone, Rene DiPietro, and Anthony Puccio. It was adapted for radio by yours truly, Joe Duran. Thanks for listening.